Hello and welcome class to our last day of Chemistry 202 in this, the spring of 2020. We are going to be finishing up the semester day or today talking about the spontaneity of electrochemical reactions. So we're going to be discussing spontaneity, the reversibility, all of that good stuff kind of like wrapping up the semester with all of the topics we've been talking about recently in one nice little bow. So looking ahead, we have Oh, whoop, I lost my pen real quick. All right, so looking ahead, we have uh, lab 10 is due on Tuesday, which is tomorrow, if you're watching this next Monday. And I say next because I am not recording it Monday morning, regardless. Uh, if you've already turned in lab 10, awesome, but this is the last lab procedure that is going to be due. So once you turn in lab 10, you are done with the lab component of Chem 202. There is also a homework assignment from last Friday that is due tonight, Monday night at 11.59, but once you finish that homework, all of your homework for Chem 202 is also finished. All of our previous in-class exams are done, participation, as long as you guys have been turning in your work, you've been getting participation credit. Uh, so yeah, all we really have left to look forward to is the final exam. So I will say, just to block this off, study guides, for chapters 17, specifically like the second half when we were talking about acid-base stuff, and 18 should now both be posted in their respective chapter folders on Blackboard. I would absolutely recommend, however, that you go back to look at uh, the study guides from chapters 10 all the way up through chapters 17 slash 18, since the uh, exam is going to be a final. It will be comprehensive, although mostly focused on the most recent content. Uh, let's see, in addition to that, I will be, if I haven't already, uh, posting the, uh, ch uh, what am I saying, the lab keys for the past couple of lab units. So basically labs 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, will have their keys be posted if they haven't been already, as well as um, chapter 3, or not chapter, exam 3, I posted that key a while ago, and exam 4, what am I doing, I should write this. Exam three slash four keys posted on Blackboard, as well as lab seven through 10 keys posted on Blackboard. If they have not been posted already, if I haven't made that announcement, they are going to be posted later today at the very latest. That way you have this material to study with uh, for the final. The exams three and four are gonna be, again, covering the most recent material from the semester, so those will be very useful keys to look at. Labs uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10, specifically 9 and 10, are going to have some really useful material from the most uh, recent sections um, of this, uh, you know, like semester's material. So in lieu of not really being able to pass any completed work back to you guys in, you know, like a meaningful way, uh, I think posting these keys, at least I'm hoping posting these keys, will be a good way to supplement your uh, studying for the final exam. All right, but those are all of the announcements I have. Let's just get started. So we are going to finish off this chapter by talking about spontaneity once again. Spontaneous electrochemistry. One such example of spontaneous electrochemistry is the process of corrosion. This is the deterioration of metal due to a spontaneous electrochemical process. The most famous example, and I've been using this as an example in other ways in like kinetics, spontaneity previously, is iron turning to rust. And normally we see this chemical reaction simply as, uh, or simply presented as solid iron combines with O2, uh, which is in a gaseous form to turn into Fe2O3. And of course we have to balance this uh, throwing a three in front of here, um, have to throw a two in front of here, throw a four in front of here, and boom, we have a balanced chemical equation. However, the actual process for water rusting is a little bit more complicated than this since this is a redox reaction. Uh, and we're at the point now where you guys have the ability to kind of understand the interconnectedness of complicated reversible chemical equations, let's just draw out what the corrosion of iron to rust actually looks like. The first of our two steps in this process is that we have two irons. These combine with O2 gas as we would expect, 
but there's also a little bit of H plus that is necessary for this reaction to take place in a truly spontaneous way. The products of the first step then are two irons in a two plus form, which are aqueous now, since we have some aqueous H plus around, uh, and some two H2Os in liquid form. The second step in the rusting of iron, we are going to take some of those irons that are now in a two plus form. In fact, we're gonna take four of them, which are in aqueous conditions. We are gonna to continue to combine these with O2 gas that are present as well as, and this is gonna look weird, but four plus two X of water. And the X is gonna come back in a second. Specifically, as rust is generated, we get two of our Fe2O3s, which is not just solid Fe2O3, but contains also trace amounts. Here's where our value of X, our variable X is coming back. But the iron or the rust, now as it has been transformed from iron, also contains trace amounts of water inside of it. And this whole thing is a solid. So the two Fe2O3s exist also in the presence uh, with water kind of inside of that network. And as the rust is generated, we get back out eight H pluses in aqueous form. All right, so here we can see in these two steps a lot of commonalities. As the uh, iron, for instance, is being generated in the first step, it is then being used up in the second step. In addition, both of these reactions require the same reactant of oxygen, but both of these in ambient conditions are just present in the atmosphere. So if we allow iron to sit out in the presence of oxygen, that's not quite enough to get it to start to deteriorate. We also need some H plus present. However, this H plus can actually be freely found in any water sample. So if it rains and this water is sitting on your car, What's fascinating about the atmosphere is that it also contains carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is a really good acidifier. Carbon dioxide actually acidifies water. And so if you have water sitting on the top of some iron with oxygen present, along with carbon dioxide being present in the atmosphere, we're gonna get this auto generation of H+, which is gonna kickstart the first step of this reaction, generating some of that Fe2+, and the Fe2+, which is around, again, oxygen from the atmosphere. And if there is water around, which in the first step we assumed that there was, we're gonna see the auto generation of this iron, which also, by the way, regenerates some H+, which can continue to fuel this first step as an additional reactant. And this is gonna keep going until all of our iron runs out. So here we see a complicated network of reactions much uh, or in much the same vein as what we saw the iodine clock reaction where there are many reactions present that are kind of fueling each other up until the point where one reactant runs out. Well, we're sure as heck not gonna run out of oxygen since that's present in abundance in the atmosphere. Same thing with this water. If it's raining, for instance, outside and that's what's kickstarting this reaction, we're not gonna run out of water anytime soon. So we are going to continue this reaction up until all of your iron has decomposed or corroded into iron oxide or rust. This is an example of a spontaneous electrochemical process. Not all spontaneous electrochemical processes are corrosion, but many of them, uh, or many of like the best examples of a spontaneous electrochemical process is corrosion. Well, we've talked about spontaneity in the past, and when talking about spontaneity in the past, I gave an example of a non-spontaneous process which does occur naturally, which was photosynthesis. Is there a such thing as a non-spontaneous electrochemical reaction that is also naturally occurring? Well, to this I say, if we have the energetic input, then yes. One such example that is actually very highly studied right now for energetic reasons and fuel-based reasons is the electrolysis of water. The electrolysis of water uses electricity to drive this non-spontaneous redox reaction in the forward direction. It is the uh, 
electrolysis of water that results in the separation of H2 and O2 gas. So in this illustration here, we actually have this like big battery pack that is hooked up to uh, two different electrodes inside of water. And the electrodes then are hooked to these like nozzles that will lead to air being generated inside H2 on one, O2 on the other. The simple form of the reaction that is the electrolysis of water is H2O, two of these in liquid form. And we have the generation of two H2 gas as well as O2 in its gaseous form. This is actually a reaction that we saw demonstrated in person last semester when introducing stoichiometry. I had set this up, uh, but yeah, this is a really uh, straightforward example of a common or commonly studied non-spontaneous electrochemical reaction. And the reason why this is so commonly studied is specifically because of the generation of the H2 gas, which is commonly or now widely being looked at as an alternative fuel source. And the real problem is not how can we generate H2 because that's actually pretty easy. It only takes nine volts to be able to get this reaction to move forward, uh, which is like any standard nine volt battery, you know, that you can buy at the grocery store will get this going. The problem is not the generation of H2, but it's the storage of H2. If we're trying to use this as a combustible fuel, well, it's not gonna be very useful or practical to store H2 in just a tank in your car because cars can get hot. If two cars crash, there's gonna be a big explosion. It's a mess. So we're trying to find a way to more meaningfully store H2 without it being like a permanent storage uh, like device where it's like impossible to get H2 out. It's like, we're trying to find that balance and that is a really hot button topic right now in the uh, you know science not just chemistry, but physics, the engineering of uh, alternative fuel sources. So in class or on, you know, lecture, whatever, last Friday, we'd also introduced the galvanic cell, where the standard energy of the cell was stated to be positive if there was a spontaneous reaction occurring, which by definition, galvanic cells always have spontaneous reactions occurring. So, how can we translate this into language that we've used before, specifically the language of Gibbs free energy? Well, this is how we can do that. Uh, electrical work done by a galvanic cell on its surroundings, right, as the electrons are leaving the reaction, moving into whatever device, or trapping the electrons, or using the electricity. Uh, the electrical work is equal to the Gibbs free energy of the galvanic cell. So what we're doing here is just stating a by definition, the energy that is created by the cell is equal to the Gibbs free energy of the cell. In the uh, equations below though, we can see that there are a couple of additional terms as well as we have two equations, one for uh, when the reaction is occurring at standard temperature and pressure, and the second is when we are not at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, the only difference that we can see between these two equations is that the first equation has this kind of standard not up above the G as well as up above the E. This uh, not is again what is shorthand for occurring at standard conditions. So it would make sense that the second equation just doesn't have those nots because we are not occurring at standard conditions. All of the rest of the variables though present inside of the equations are the same. So for the sake of space, I'm gonna label everything down below, but the same labelings apply to the first equation as well. Uh, our G of cell is short for our Gibbs free energy of the cell. This is what we are calculating as the reaction, the redox reaction moves in the forward direction. We are going to get some measure of our free energy. And for a spontaneous reaction, this uh, delta G should be, uh, let's see, less than zero. All right, the uh, second variable that is here is an N. What this N stands for is moles of electrons. So as a reaction is occurring, as we have written before, let's say copper solid is oxidized to create copper two plus, in aqueous conditions, as well as it generates two electrons. This two is what would be equal to N if we were to go forward calculating some type of Gibbs free energy for the cell. 
Um, so that's where that number is coming from. That's what the N is short for, is the number of electrons that are generated, that stoichiometric coefficient in front of the number of electrons in your balanced either reduction or oxidation reaction. F stands for Faraday's constant. If you want a real good like feel good story about people working in science, I would suggest looking at the history of Faraday. He is probably one of my favorite scientists simply because he was a common man who just loved science so much and said, you know what, that's what I'm gonna do. And he made that future happen. So Faraday now has this constant named after him uh, and it is equal to 9.65 times 10 to the fourth uh, coulombs for every mole of electrons. So we can see that if we take the moles of electrons and multiply it by Faraday's constant, the moles of electrons units will cancel out here. The only thing that's left then is the uh, energy of the cell or the uh, cell potential, which is what your E cell is. This is your cell potential, which if you're working at standard conditions uh, or not at standard conditions, if you're working at standard conditions, your cell potential Let's see, cell potential. I'll do it up here just to make it really clear that I am looking at the standard cell potential. Your E naught of cell, again, is equal to that previous equation that we learned on Friday, where we are going to take the standard energy of your cathode, cathode, and subtract out the standard energy of your anode. So we're kind of getting, uh, we're tying all of these equations together. So we can experimentally determine what the standard energy of our cell is. We can use that to find a standard Gibbs free energy as well. We will look in a little bit for uh, how we work with the Gibbs uh, energy here for electrical work if we're not at standard conditions, but we're going to focus on at standard conditions first. All right, so let's say we are studying electrical work. Let's uh, also say that we are studying the electrical work of a very common battery, a lead acid battery. Lead acid batteries are also known as car batteries. So this is a standard battery that you could find inside of any vehicle. Uh, a lead acid battery produces a cell potential of exactly 2.00 volts according to the redox reaction that is listed below. We can use all of this information now to find the free energy of our battery. So our free energy equation that we are going to be working with is the delta G naught. We are looking for the free energy of standard conditions here. Our delta G of cell is equal to negative N times F times delta E naught of cell. All right, so we're told what our cell potential is. The cell potential is exactly two volts. So our E naught of cell has already been determined. We can just plug in two volts for this value here. The other two values, uh, we don't necessarily have to work too hard to find, right? Our F is Faraday's constant, which is already told to us. This is that 9.65 times 10 to the fourth coulombs per mole of electrons. The only number that we don't have explicitly told to us is N, but we do have the balanced chemical equation below which we can use to find what N is. So in order to figure out how many electrons are being transferred, we have a balanced chemical equation. All we have to do is observe the oxidation numbers of every species inside of this balanced equation to figure out what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and in the process, how many electrons are being transferred. All right, so let's just start at the beginning. Let's start with our lead solid. Since this is a free element, its oxidation number is gonna be equal to zero. And so I'm just gonna write out the numbers, but understand that each number I'm writing is an oxidation number. All right, in lead oxide, according to our hierarchical rules of oxidation numbers, we will consider oxygen first, since the rule for oxygen is listed higher than any transition metal. And according to our hierarchical rules, each of these oxygens will have a negative two oxidation number. And in order to keep this compound neutral, what that means is that the charge on our lead or the oxidation number on our lead has to be plus four. The other species that is present are uh, sulfuric acid, the hydrogen we will consider first, 
Each of these hydrogens gets a plus one. According to our hierarchical rules, between sulfur and oxygen, we next consider oxygen, and each of these four oxygens will have a negative two oxidation number. And what this means is that, again, in order to keep this compound as a balanced compound with a total charge equal to zero, this one sulfur must have a plus six oxidation number. All right, if we look then on the right as a product, here we have lead sulfate. According to uh, a very highly listed rule in our hierarchical rules, the uh, charge on an ionic compound or the charge of a cation or, an or anion inside of the compound is equal to its oxidation number. And so the lead sulfate, we can break into lead with a two plus charge and the sulfate with a two minus charge, which means that our lead here has a plus two charge. The sulfur in the sulfate and the oxygen in the sulfate have the exact same charges or oxidation numbers as what were previously listed on the reactant side. In water, the hydrogen has an oxidation number of plus one and oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two. All right, so here we have all of our oxidation numbers presented and here is where we now need to look for some type of change. Well, we can see that on the reactant side, we have lead with a zero, lead with a four plus, and on the product side, we have lead with a plus two. And from what we can tell, these are the only oxidation numbers that change from the reactant to the product side. Right, oxygen, both or both of the oxygens on the reactant side have a minus two oxidation number. Same with the oxygens uh, that are present on the right hand side. Since the oxygens don't change, these are not things that are being oxidized or reduced. They're just kind of there. Uh, the hydrogens, both on the left and the right, have oxidation numbers of plus one and the sulfurs have oxidation numbers of plus six. And so here we can see the only things that change are the leads that are present. Everything else is a mediator for the redox reaction. And so this may look strange, but what we are, are like, what is symbolically happening here is that the electrons from this neutral lead are transferring to the lead uh, that has already a positive charge present because in the final state, there's only one type of lead and that one type of lead has a two plus charge. So from this, we can gather that two electrons are transferring from the lead that has no charge to the lead that has four plus. This is going to give the lead that previously had no charge a two plus charge since it's losing two electrons. And the lead that has the four plus charge is going to end up with a two plus charge since it's gaining two electrons. So we have this kind of balancing now where we had two different leads to start with and only one lead at the end and that lead had a two plus charge. The reason why we did all of this again was to figure this exactly out. How many electrons are being transferred? Now that we have how many electrons are being transferred, we know what our value of N is in our Gibbs free energy equation. So we can calculate now what the standard energy for our cell is, since this is gonna be equal to negative two moles of electrons times Faraday's constant, which is 9.65 times 10 to the fourth uh, coulombs per every mole of electrons. And this is going to be multiplied by the voltage or the cell potential, which is 2.00 volts. And our total calculation here is then going to give us a value that is negative 3.86 times 10 to the fifth. And if we look at our units, moles of electrons are canceling, coulombs and volts are what remain. All right, so this is a weird unit. We haven't seen coulomb volts before, but actually we have. By definition, a coulomb volt, coulomb times volt is equal to a joule. So the negative 3.86 times 10 to the negative five is actually an energy in the unit of joules. And here now we can see that there is a negative Gibbs energy as one would expect for a spontaneous reaction. This is taking place in a galvanic cell. A lead acid battery is a battery that is known to function spontaneously, right? You turn your car on, the battery is working unless something's wrong with your battery, in which case you have to go to the mechanic because the battery that we already knew to be spontaneous, um, or rather because we are working with a battery that we knew it was going to be spontaneous, it makes sense that the sign on our Gibbs free energy is negative, signaling again uh, consistently that we are working with a spontaneous reaction. 
So what happens if your calculation though is not taking place at standard conditions? All right, so let's go backwards. I'd said already uh, that standard conditions are a little bit easier to work with since we have this like reduction potential table, we can calculate a standard potential for your total cell. If we are working though with our second equation, we are not at STP. The only real difference in our approach is that we would have to have an experimentally determined energy for our cell. That's the only real difference. Uh, even if we are not at standard conditions, uh, cells are still able to function spontaneously. And this uh, value then for the energy of the cell would either be told to you as an experimental value, or you would be given a Gibbs free energy and asked to find the experimentally determined energy of the cell. Um, but that's the only real difference here. So we would follow the exact same steps that we followed in the example problem here. It's just that the value of the energy that's being given to you would be explicitly told to you as an experimental value. All right, so let's keep moving forward. So here now we are going to introduce a scientist by the name of Walther Nernst. He was a German physicist slash chemist. Uh, he lived a pretty long, good life, uh, focused mostly on chemistry and science in general, physics. Uh, he was looking at the connectedness then between electrochemical cells and reversible conditions as measured through an equilibrium constant of K. What he reasoned was that if the energy or the standard energy of your cell can be related to some Gibbs free energy, which is what we just learned, this equation here, and also, as we've previously learned, delta G can be related to chemical equilibrium through this equation here, well, then it stands to reason that a standard Gibbs free energy is equal to another standard Gibbs free energy. And as a result, the two representations of Gibbs energies on the right hand side of the equation can be related. This is going to give you a relationship between your standard cell energy and an equilibrium constant K. So any reversible reaction potentially can also have an associated uh, cell potential. Any reaction that occurs in the straightforward direction that write a complete reaction, we can actually use an electrochemical setup to determine what its extreme, either extremely high or extremely low equilibrium constant K can be. This is what leads us to the Nernst equation at standard uh, temperature and pressure. If we set the two previous Gibbs equations equal to one another and rearrange to find or solve for the E naught of the cell, this is the equation that we get. This is known as the Nernst equation. The energy of our cell, therefore, can said to be equal to a value of 0.0592 volts, all divided by n, multiplied by the log of our equilibrium constant k. So the n that is present here is again a measure of the moles of electrons. Our k is an equilibrium constant. And the value of the 0 0.0592 volts on top looks a little strange, but this comes from a combination of Faraday's constant as well as the standard temperature and pressure, where your standard temperature is taking place right at 298 Kelvin, your standard pressure is one atmosphere. So in rearranging and solving for the energy cell or the cell potential energy uh, in the Nernst equation here, we've kind of combined all of those constants into this one new constant that is explicitly written out as 0 0.0592. If you want to see these calculations for yourself, I would encourage you to check out the textbook. They actually lay out the step-by-step -step derivation, how we rearrange and solve for the potential energy of our cell as a function of the equilibrium constant. So here now we have an example problem of using the Nernst equation at STP. So let's say a standard potential, right? So an E naught, within some galvanic cell where we have a spontaneous reaction occurring was found to be 1.14 volts when two electrons were transferred from manganese to two silver ions. What is the equilibrium constant for this redox reaction at standard temperature and pressure? 
So all we have to do is use the Nernst equation that we previously learned. There's not actually a lot of variables in the Nernst equation, which makes it algebraically fairly easy to use. The standard energy of our cell is equal to that 0.0592 volts, all divided by N times the log of K. And we are given a uh, cell potential here, a 1.14 volts. This is equal to 0.0592 volts, all divided by, we are told, two electrons are being transferred, so two moles of electrons. This is all multiplied then by the log of k. We can rearrange and solve for what k is now that we have this value just straightforwardly given to us, or these values straightforwardly given. We have one equation and one unknown. So let's say we multiply the two up, we divide the 0.0592 down. This gives us then a value that is equal to 38.51 equal to the log of k. In order to solve for k, therefore, all we have to do is take both of these values, raise them into the exponent of 10, and even before calculating any number, 10 to the 38.51, 10 to the 38 even, is huge, right? That's a big number. In explicitly calculating what this value is equal to, we find that it is equal to 3.236 times 10 to the 38. This is equal to our value of k. This is a humongous equilibrium constant. I mean, really, the information that this is giving us is that the equation or reaction that is occurring, this manganese giving two electrons uh, to the silver plus, there's a redox reaction that is going on. This is a very complete reaction. It is not very reversible, right? Large Ks represent large values of product being produced. In other words, once the reaction moves forward and generates product, very, very little is going to come back. Very, very little product is going to regenerate reactant. We are going to, as a result, be working with a complete reaction. This also makes sense as a reaction moving forward, uh, right, the transfer, or which will be transferring electrons from the manganese to the two silvers, right, two electrons here. It makes sense that the reaction as it's moving forward is going to be generating a voltage for us because if this reaction were to truly be reversible and give two electrons back, we wouldn't actually end up seeing a net change in electrons, which means there would be no voltage. In conclusion, we can say that because this reaction is experimentally determined to be a very complete reaction, we get the generation of electrons in one direction as the reactants turn into products spontaneously. And once the reactants turn into products, the reaction is complete and your battery dies. This is what leads us now to studying reversible electrochemical cells when we are not at STP. And the reason why we're studying this not at STP is a reaction, as we just stated, will move forward until some finishing point. Either the forward reaction is complete or, as we will see here, equilibrium is reached. Once these conditions are met, your battery is dead. There's no more net transfer of electrons that can occur. So here what we're going to do is follow the same rationale that Nernst did to uh, come up with the Nernst equation at STP. So the energy or the cell potential of your cell can be related to your Gibbs free energy. In this case now, we are not at STP, so we don't have those little not symbols present on the E cell or the uh, delta G. The equation that we learned though previously, we can see here, delta G is equal to NF times E cell. This is the exact same form as our previous equation. We've also though related delta G to chemical equilibrium, specifically a Q. Delta G represents a Gibbs free energy not at standard conditions, which means that we have not quite yet made it to equilibrium. And if we're not quite at equilibrium, we are working with a reaction quotient. And so the equation that we learned before that relates delta G not at standard conditions to a reaction quotient is listed here, where delta G is equal to a delta G not plus the conditions that are not at equilibrium yet. If though, just like before, we relate our two delta G's together 
and allow the two right-hand sides to be equal to each other, we can rearrange and solve for a value of the energy of our cell. All right, and that's exactly what Nernst did, giving us what we can see below is the Nernst equation not at standard conditions. However, this equation is the most commonly used and very useful equation for figuring out exactly what the discharge value of a battery is before it dies. And the reason is, is that most batteries don't actually function at STP. Most batteries are either uh, under pressure or under vacuum or don't function at room temperature because the battery itself gets hot, right? There's a lot of heat that's being generated in like electrical equipment. And so because of that, an electrical or an electrochemical cell that is not at STP will eventually reach an equilibrium, which according to our reversible reaction terminology is the equivalent of the reaction being finished. When we are at equilibrium, there is no net flow of electrons and the electrochemical cell dies. It ceases to exist. This is what is being represented in the graph on the right hand side. We have cell potential on the Y axis, level of discharge on the X axis. But what we're really looking at here is the cell potential as a function of time. So as you look at the cell potential, let's say this is just a standard lithium ion battery. This is some type of battery. Over time, your battery is going to be slowly discharging, slowly discharging, slowly discharging. You are uh, at this point like pulling out, uh, you know, electrons from the reaction, your device is functioning. And then very quickly, when you are out of discharge, boom, your battery hits zero cell potential and dies. However, this battery, if it is a rechargeable battery, can be brought back to life. Uh, we can see that here is not like where zero is hit on the uh, actual like Y axis, it's gonna be somewhere down here. But if we were to plug your battery back in, we would uh, see that the battery then would slowly charge and come back up to full, where if you then take it off of charge, you can use the battery again uh, ad infinitum up until the point where the battery actually physically degrades to the point where it can't be charged anymore. The Nernst equation that gives us a prediction for where we are on this discharge uh, map, where we are versus like maximum cell potential all the way down to like, boom, it dies. Uh, that's what this Nernst equation is useful for. So the standard energy of the cell, this is the maximum energy that could, uh, or that a particular cell could possibly have. That is going to be our uh, y-intercept over here on the chart. This is our E naught. Where we actually are then as a function of like level of discharge on the x-axis is going to be a measure uh, or a calculation based off of the right-hand side of the equation, this right term, where we're going to be subtracting out 0 0.09 or 592 volts divided by N times the log of Q, which is our reaction quotient. Quotient, there we go. Spelling. So if we take the maximum energy and subtract out in like what this term kind of represents here is how much of the cell that we have used, what's the voltage that's been used up, like how close are we to equilibrium versus how far away are we? The farther away from equilibrium we are, the closer we are going to be to these initial conditions, the closer we're gonna to be to like max cell potential. The more and more we use the reactants and generate products or the closer and closer we get to equilibrium, the closer and closer we get then to our calculated uh, cell potential coming to zero. So let's look at an example of using the Nernst equation not at STP, uh, specifically for a commonly used electrical device battery known as a zinc air battery. Uh, the zinc air battery functions off of solid zinc just being in the presence of oxygen gas. The standard cell potential for the zinc air battery is found to be 1.65 volts. So since this is labeled as our standard cell potential, we can say that this is our E naught of cell. If at 298 Kelvin, so we'll give it the benefit of, uh, benefit of the doubt that we're at least at standard temperature. The uh, standard temperature then 298 Kelvin, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air diffusing through the cathode is 0.12 atmospheres. What is the cell potential? We have in the balanced chemical equation below, two zinc solids interacting with oxygen gas to give us two zinc 
oxides. The zinc oxides here we can see are also a solid. The equation that we're going to be using then, since we're asked to find a cell potential, and also because we just talked about it, that's exactly what we are studying right now, is the Nernst equation when we are not at standard potential. So we can get uh, a good visual for like what it means, how we can use it. Uh, so we have the cell potential is equal to our san or standard cell potential minus 0 0.0592 volts, all divided by two, multiplied by the log of Q. So there are two things that we, N. Um, so there are two things that we need to find. I was thinking ahead to the number two. Uh, we need to find uh, the E naught of the cell. Well, that was given to us in the wording of the problem, check. We need to find the N, uh, like how many electrons are transferred in this redox reaction, and we need to find our reaction quotient Q. All right, so E naught of cell, again, we have found that. So let's turn our attention to finding the N first. As we did in the lead ion battery example, we are going to look at the chemical equation and figure out, all right, what is uh, the total number of electrons that are being transferred here as we observe um, the redox numbers, the uh, oxidation numbers for these species. We can do that as we have done in the past. Both of our reactants here are free elements, meaning that they have no oxidation number. And the product is an ionic compound where the cation has a two plus charge and the anion has a two minus charge. We can see that the uh, number of electrons that are being transferred from the zinc to the oxygen is two, right? The, ox or the zinc started with a neutral charge of zero, has turned into a two plus charge. The oxygen started at neutral and turned into a two minus, which means that there must have been uh, two electrons transferred from the zinc to the oxygen. This means that our n value here is going to be equal to two moles of electrons. All right, the other piece of information we need now is to find a Q. So we are going to now have to uh, default back onto thinking like chapter 15, reversible reactions. How do I write an equilibrium expression? Because you write Q in the exact same way as you write K. It is always products over reactants, always. Specifically here, we are working with heterogeneous equilibrium and we have to remember that solids don't count. Doesn't matter that they comprise the majority of the reaction here, solids don't have variable concentrations, they don't have variable pressures, therefore we do not include them. What this means is that our Q is going to be equal to one, since we need some type of like algebraic placeholder here, divided by the pressure that we are given, we are going to not be working with a QC, but a QP. Our QP is going to be equal to one divided by the partial pressure of our oxygen gas, which is the only uh, reactant that is present in gaseous form. Our Q, therefore, is going to be equal to one divided by 0 0.12 atmospheres. This, uh, or this Q, now we can just insert into the log of the Q here. Like if we want, we can solve explicitly for what Q is, but we could just take one divided by 0.12 and plug that in explicitly. So the uh, overall slide, I'm gonna clear up here real quick so that way I actually have room to write. The energy of the cell is going to be equal to the standard energy of the cell, which uh, in the wording of the problem was stated to be 1.65 volts. We are going to subtract out 0 0.0592 volts, all divided by two moles of electrons, which we just, again, found from uh, the balanced chemical equation as two electrons are transferring from the zinc to the oxygen. We're going to take this and multiply it by the log of one divided by 0 0.12, since this is the value of our Q, our Q being equal to one divided by the partial pressure of our oxygen. All right, so from here, we now can uh, actually calculate what the standard, or not the standard, what the uh, cell potential is going to be not at standard conditions. And we find that the uh, total from this calculation is 1.62 volts. All right, so let's inspect this a little bit. At standard conditions, our cell potential is 1.65 volts. Where we are now is 1.62 volts. If we go back to our sort of like discharge map here, as we're going from cell potential on the y-axis and sort of like a measure of time sort of here on the x-axis, 
what this means is that compared to standard conditions, we are probably like right here. We have not lost a ton of our potential yet. We have not uh, come close to reaching equilibrium. Equilibrium is what will bring us down to that discharge uh, or cell potential of zero once we have hit 100% discharge value. We have completed the reaction at that point. Uh, where we are right now, the sink air battery is not near equilibrium, meaning that the reaction will continue to progress in the forward direction, not at standard conditions, until uh, the total pressure of our oxygen basically hits zero, which is when all of this will turn into uh, an equilibrium constant K, um, giving us a cell potential that is equal to zero as like both of these terms then cancel out. Congratulations, everyone. This is the end of your final lecture in General Chemistry 202 in this the spring of 2020. Over the course of today's lecture, we talked about the spontaneity of redox reactions, as well as the spontaneity if we are not at standard conditions. We introduced a couple new equations. Uh, I would absolutely recommend you guys get the practice uh, in using these equations in these suggested problems here, since there is no homework following this lecture. All we really have left to look forward to, uh, again, you have an assignment that's due tomorrow, your Lab 10 assignment, tomorrow being Tuesday. Uh, if you haven't turned that in yet, if you already have, you're finished. Um, all we really have left after this is, yeah, the final. If you are, again, in the 9 a.m. section uh, and your, or the 9 a.m., 10 a.m. section and your final is not at a time that works for you, either because, uh, you know, you're on the West Coast or because you've started working and job, like whatever your job is, won't give you the time off, even though you have a scheduled final, etc. Absolutely. Let me know whatever your situation is. We can try and figure out uh, when an alternate time for you to take the exam would be. But... Otherwise, you will be taking the final exam at your already preordained scheduled time slot according to the registrar's office. If you have any lingering questions, do not hesitate to let me know. Read up in the textbook, get that practice in, look through the study guides, do whatever you can to finish off this semester strong, but I'm still going to give you that hearty congratulations because you deserve it. Class is dismissed. <laughs>